Well hello, my name is Andy Tidy and welcome back to another series of Canal Hunter. I'm going to call this the Lockdown Legacy series because I'm filming it during the coronavirus outbreak in the early part of 2020 and I'm using the time to look back on some of the archive material I've got and to bring that to you um, in readiness for the day when I can get the GoPro out on the field and I can show you these things um, in real time as it were. And the area that I want to focus on this time are what I euphemistically call the tugboat canals of Telford. Now Telford as a geographic new town didn't exist when these canals were built. The canals which cover what is now Telford actually covered the places like Dorley Magna, Rockradeen Wood, um, Donington Wood um, and Oakham Gates and Ketley, small villages out in Shropshire. What then happened was that in the 1960s and 1970s the new town of Telford was built and it was dropped slam bang in the middle of this discrete network of canals. Now I should give you a little bit of context before we start diving into the, uh, uh, the tugboat canals of Telford. About 10 years ago when I started looking for lost canals um, I went on a cycle ride with my brother and my son and we started off at Norbury Junction and headed off basically all the way through to Shrewsbury. Or is that Shrewsbury? Never sure which. Anyhow, as we went past Wappensall Junction my mother pointed off to the left and said now that, that bit of canal up there that goes to Trench and beyond Trench there's a bunch of tugboat canals. She said I've heard there's some remains in the woods and that was the end of the comment but it stuck in my mind and so the following winter I decided I was going to have a look and see what these tugboat canals were all about. Now part of my previous dismissive view of the tugboat canals in the area was because I guess I'm very narrow boat minded focused and I could see the interest of following the old line down from uh, Norbury Junction to Shrewsbury because the old proper narrow boats used to trade that way. But is a tugboat canal a real canal? Is it even worth going to explore? Well I did a bit of research and the answer is a big thumbs up, yeah, really worth going to look at. You see canals are built to suit their local requirements. So when you built the Leeds Liverpool Canal you built them wide and short in order to accommodate the boats which frequented the River Mersey on one side and out on the air and the colder and the hebble on the other side. But when you got to the Midlands where water was in short supply they built very long thin canals because it optimised the amount of water available. In the Shrewsbury area they were confronted with massively wealthy mineral deposits of coal, ironstone and limestone, the three basic ingredients for an iron industry, but it was incredibly hilly and very very dry. So whilst they could dig a canal, and actually the canals did look just like an ordinary canal, same kind of width and depth and bridges, what they couldn't do is supply enough water or have enough time in order to make locks to go up and down as they would need to. The altitude changes were just too great. So the defining feature of the tugboat canals were that instead of rising and falling over the hills using flights of locks, they used inclined planes and they built five of them. And the inclined plane was built in order that you put the boat, the tugboat, into the cradle and it was a pair of matched inclines so as one went up another one went down and, uh, and so you lifted your boat up or lowered it down to the right level and then you continued on your journey. And because these were rectangular tugboats which were about 20 feet long and about six foot six wide, um, you strung them together in batches of, of four or more and then you towed them along with a horse just in the normal way. So the canals were the same but the method of rising and falling was different. So the canals that I want to explore in these virtual hunts um, are the tugboat canals into which no narrow boat could ever penetrate. 
but that doesn't mean they're not interesting. In fact, the canals in the area I want to look at were among the first to be built. And the one I want to start to look at is the Donington Wood Canal. The Donington Wood Canal was the brainchild of Earl Gower. He was a politician and uh, an industrialist. He also happened to be the brother-in-law of the Duke of Bridgewater, and you'll know him from building the Bridgewater Canal in Manchester. Very famous. Now, like his brother-in-law to the north, Earl Gower needed to be able to transfer his coal, which was found under the woods at, uh, at Rockerdean Wood and, uh, and Donington Wood, and to be able to amalgamate that with his limestone works at Lillishaw. And then he needed to be able to get the end result back out into the outside world. For that, he needed to build the five and a half mile Donington Wood Canal, which he built in 1767. And if you remember some of my previous videos, that's two years before the Birmingham Canal was joined, was built. And his connection with the Duke of Bridgewater didn't end with it just being his brother-in-law. He was also an investor in the Bridgewater Canal. He was also a principal proprietor of the Trenton Mersey, along with his brother-in-law. So I guess it comes as no surprise that there's a lot of overlap between the, uh, between the building of the Bridgewater Canal, the first section, and the building of the Donington Wood Canal. In fact, the overlap was so strong that the land agents on the two canals were the brothers John and Thomas Gilbert. John Gilbert worked for the Duke of Bridgewater, and Thomas Gilbert worked for Earl Gower. And so Earl Gower built his canal entirely within his own grounds, all the way through from Donington Wood to a place called Pave Lane, which was on the Turnpike Road between Newport and Wolverhampton. And that connected his coal mines to the outside world, but it didn't connect to his limestone works at Lillishall. So at Lillishall, he needed to connect into another canal that went out to the north. Uh, initially he did this with a lower level canal which went into a tunnel which you can still see and above the tunnel there were twin um, wells if you like and they were counterbalanced buckets that went up and down so that as the coal went down the lighter limestone came up and they were transshipped between boats. The craft on the uh, Lillishaw branch was smaller, well it's still 20 feet long, but they're only one and a half feet deep, and they took about two to three tons of payload. And the Lillishaw branch also had uh, a, a further sub-branch which went to Pitchcroft. That dropped down through seven very small locks and uh, served a coal mine out there and provided a backdoor entrance into other parts of the very extensive limestone workings. Now if you think back to the construction of the Bridgewater Canal, when it reached Castlefields it went to Merchant's Quay and at Merchant's Quay the canal ran into a tunnel and the loads were lifted up through a vertical shaft. So there's an exact parallel with the Lillishall incline. However this was slow, um, time consuming and it did depend on your minerals being balanced in how much needed to come in and go out at the same time. So that solution didn't persist. So after 23 years of operation in 1790, the 43 foot variation in height was overcome by means of an inclined plane. What he con constructed was based directly on the inclined plane technology used by the Duke of Bridgewater in his underground mines in Worsley. He built a twin track inclined plane 123 yards long with a steam engine at the top. And again, one boat going down would largely balance out the boat coming up, and any friction was overcome by the steam engine. Now that plane and its uh, plateways has long gone, but the line of a canal running flat down between the top canal and the bottom canal can still be seen, as can the pond into which the boats floated at the bottom. There was one further branch built, it was only a short branch, but up near Donington Wood the, the Earl built the Lodge Foundry and it had five enormous blast furnaces into it 
and the lodge foundry uh, was accessed by a branch which went under a bridge and into a basin. These days the basin has been restored, um, although the bollards sit there slightly surprised and out of place, and the pictorial representation board on the edge of the basin has this uh, slightly bizarre scene of narrowboats working uh, in and out. Uh, these are diesel powered narrowboats. Now this was a canal on which no narrowboat ever ventured and it was a canal which closed down in 1888 and therefore this predated the uh, invention of the diesel engine. So wrong on both counts but nice idea. And the Lillishaw branch was superseded when a mineral line was built in 1873. And this connected directly through from that area out to the Humber branch of the Newport Canal. And it did so without all the hassle of going down the trench incline and the locks beyond. Of course, with the trade dying away, the canal arm also died. And between uh, 1878, 1879, that was quietly closed down. And then the business out to Pave Lane because there was another easier route to the external market. That also the trade dwindled away and uh, eventually that was abandoned in 1890. And if that wasn't enough, about a mile and a half up uh, from, from Pave Lane, um, the Earl decided he wanted a new grand driveway to approach Lillishall Hall. And to do this, he simply filled in the canal and built the driveway bang on top. And even today, if you go along that piece of roadway, you'll find a canal bridge spanning the road with its foundations dug out in order to make a level road. Now, I suppose the, it begs the question, what can be seen on the line today? Well, when I went and did these investigations, which kind of started about uh, eight to ten years ago, I didn't have the benefit of the side-by-side -side mapping systems that you have online today. I was using the Godfrey edition OS maps from 1902, printed versions, and they were absolutely excellent up to a point. But of course even in 1902 the bulk of the canals I was looking for had been long since abandoned, but nonetheless on those maps it shows the area, the line of the old canal, some bits were in water and there were some bits missing, but you could kind of join the dots to work out where the line went. What it didn't do, of course, was to locate exactly on the ground where you should look. So there was a fair bit of toing and froing to work out where we were going. However, the Donington Wood Canal is several miles to the north of Ten Telford Town Centre and hasn't been too badly built over and there are a surprising number of bits you can go and find. The Donington Wood End was probably the most heavily built over. In the 1960s and 1970s the new town did spread out to this area, um, but the first built remains you can find are very near the Rockardine Wood Inclined Plain, and it's uh, a bridge which still remains kind of emerging from underneath Smith's Crescent. And there's some photos of that, which I can show you both now and from the 1960s. Now, from here on, the canal kind of can be found here and there. It comes around the edges of the old site of the Donington Wood Furnace, but it doesn't really become apparent until you can get out away from the housing and into the public open space. And that's out um, nearer the Shropshire Golf Centre. And on the way out, you pass the site of numerous quarries. Meadow Quarry, Waxhill Barracks Colliery, Muxton Bridge Colliery. These are all relatively shallow pits. And then later on, the huge Granville Colliery came in and they went down and did deep mining underneath. And they literally went out for miles and caused subsidence for miles. Here and there, the line can be traced. Sometimes it's a ditch. Sometimes it's a line of ventilation shafts sticking up through the mud to ventilate out the old canal bed. And of course, there is the remains of the lodge basin. 
The canal really gets into its stride when you approach the golf course. First of all there's the Muxton um, colliery pumping engine which continued to pump until 1926 and it was when that was turned off that the water supply stopped and the canal dried out. But within the golf course the line of the canal is really really obvious. In fact they've used the canal as one amazingly good water trap, really really authentic. But of course, going to see that means you have to get up very early in the morning before even the first golfers have got off the tee. And then beyond the golf course, the line of the canal has largely been dug back into the fields, but its line is still faithfully recorded in the field boundaries. And then re-emerges again when you get to Lillishall Abbey. And to the rear of Lillishall Abbey Farm, there is a perfectly uh, perfect canal bridge just standing, isolated, 
um, beyond, but beside the fields. You'll find that many of the road bridges still exist. And I'll show these um, to accompany this narrative. But then you come to the Lillishall Incline and the old stables and the winding house for the incline are still occupied and still used. And there is a public footpath that allows you to walk to one side of that, get down to the bottom of the hill and you can see the line of the incline sloping its way down to the water at the bottom. And if you get close enough you can see a lovely snatch of the top end of the, the tunnel into which the tub boats were pushed in order to unload. Beyond that, the Lillishall Arm itself runs in water, getting ever drier as you work your way out. It's at the Wilmore Lane Bridge, which does still exist, although it's all sagging and buckled with all the subsidence. Um, that's where the junction to the Pitchcroft Arm went off. The Pitchcroft Arm contained those locks, and the discernible feature there is that as the locks went down the hill, the, uh, the hedgerow around them, or the, or the boundary, came in and out, in and out, in and out. And you can still see that reflected in the hedgerows today. Beyond the site of the incline, again, the canal disappears out into the farmland and has been largely ploughed under, except for that section on the driveway into Lillishall Hall. And then finally, the line of the canal veers off the roadway and turns into Pave Lane and the canal bridge under Pave Lane still exists. The canal bed is a feature in the gardens in the area and then it terminates on the site of the old Turnpike Road. Now there are a few public footpaths which actually follow the entire line of this canal but there is a lot of public open space in the area and for the most part, and the interesting parts, it is quite possible to go and have a look. But I would suggest this is one for going on foot rather than by bicycle. It really does justify a day out with a packed lunch in the wilds of Shropshire, exploring what was one of the earliest independent canals ever built. And don't be put off by the fact it was just a tugboat canal. These tugboat canals reflected the geographic and economic needs of the area and they are just as important a part of our waterways heritage as the bigger and persistent waterways which we still have with us today. So as soon as the restrictions are lifted I will get myself out to Telford and I will film this properly and you can see it but in the meantime I hope you've enjoyed watching all of the stills that I took when I did do my investigations and you'll be primed and ready to go for when I get this in the can properly. So I hope you've enjoyed this unusual um, episode of Canal Hunter and uh, in future episodes I'm going to have a look at the other canals um, which featured in this network out here in what we now know today as Telford.